Welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 296. That's 296. Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you might be today. As I'm sure most of you are aware, we're all locked down inside our apartments, inside our sheds, inside our, I don't know, book bags, inside our tote bags, inside a weird room. We're all inside somewhere doing something so hopefully this is receiving you well and you haven't decided to hang yourself off your little you know chest of drawers somewhere if you're that short or off of a mirror somewhere in your room i know dark and macabre but i'm in that kind of mood at the moment but anyway um i'm feeling great feeling good um i've kind of been doing a lot of fasting doing a lot of running doing a lot of reading watching a lot of movies watching a lot of tv series get myself into all that sort of stuff getting nice and inspired um i recently saw an amazing post i think it was on um it might have been on what was it on I'm going to say it was on the BBC. David Hockney recently actually announced. Is it David Hockney? It must be him, right? David Hockney recently announced or recently shared some images of a... Shereen showed some work that he did recently uh, via visit in Normandy. Um, Some landscape drawings, some landscape paintings, sorry, that I thought were really beautiful. That kind of got me inspired. And I thought, you know what? During this whole... Um, pandemic when we're locked down. I'm gonna get my paint brushes back out again. I'm gonna start just painting what's outside my window, um, just kind of visualizing things and trying to um, get my mind to kind of get into that creative mood again. This is the article that kind of talks about it. I'll just quickly go through it now. It says David Hockney shares exclusive art from Normandy as a respite for the news, which is really good. Um, it says here David Hockney is in a lockdown at his house in Normandy with his dog Ruby and two of his standing assistants. Um, JP and Jonathan, which is pretty cool, isn't it, right? That you have this ability to be like, you know, stranded somewhere in the middle of Normandy. I think a lot of people did this anyway on purpose, right? Some people purposely went away from where they actually live to a little cottage somewhere that they have outside of the main city to go and kind of relax. So they're not stuck in a, so they're not stuck, you know, in a metropolitan city having to scr- having to fight for resources, which is a great idea i think especially if you've got a young family it probably isn't advisable to stay here you probably your kids will probably go stir crazy not being able to run outside and have some fresh air i understand that but obviously there is that risk that you're running that you're actually taking or transporting the virus from one place where everyone's highly infected but densely populated and you're closer to medical supplies and you're taken to another place where people are sparsely populated and there's not many medical supplies so it's a bit of a double-edged sword but i understand it you know if you've got a family it is what it is and if you're david hockney's age you know, and he's still, you know, he's still painting, he's still thriving. The last thing he can risk is being in his studio somewhere in London and then catching the coronavirus, not being able to recover because he's at that weird age, and it? Where it seems to be a bit of a death sentence. But this is a really cool article that explains this. Said, um, he's in his garden most days drawing with uh, drawing the spring awakenings on his iPad. In a BBC exclusive, he's sharing 10 of his most recent images, including one animation, nine of which were never been published before for us to all enjoy a difficult time which is super nice if you're meant to do that i'm sure some people are going to take those paintings and probably get them printed um out or hung up in their walls or he'll probably end up selling himself the artist previously visited normandy in the autumn of 2018 for an installation of his stained glass window in the westminster abbey he thought it would be a good place to draw and paint the arrival of spring something he'd um done around a decade early in east yorkshire these pictures, paintings, and films were the basis of a successful exhibition in 2012 at the Royal Academy in London. He was attracted to Normandy because it offered a broader range of blossoms with apple, cherry, pear, and plum trees, as well as hawthorn and black fawn he had painted before. We found this house with a large garden that was cheaper than anything in Sussex, and they bought it, renovated it, and bought a small studio and have been there ever since in early March. He says, I began the... I began drawing the winter trees on my new iPad, he said. Then the virus started. I went on drawing the winter trees that eventually burst into blossom. This is the stage where we are right now. Meanwhile, the virus is going mad and many people said my drawings were a great respite for what was going on. He sent some of his work in progress to friends, which led him to releasing one image of Daffodils for publication, which titled, Do You Remember They Can't Cancel the Spring? That's awesome. I love that title. He is now sharing his nine more, all painted in the last few days. Why are my iPad drawings? seen as a respite for the news he says well they're obviously made by hand depicting the renewal that is spring it's a part of the world in this part of the world so he says um the point being that his images are the product of him looking directly at nature and despic- and, and depicting or representing what he sees by transmitting um, his sensory reaction through his fingers onto papers via a pencil rather than mediate the mediating the process through a photograph 
uh, it continues here. It says his pictures are a record of how he quick, uniquely is expressing reality of his subject and the space in which it exists. The one-eyed mechanical camera flattens out all the individual nuances. You know, this is probably art speak for the sake of it, but the drawings and the paint themselves are really, really beautiful, really unique. Obviously, in their style, the quintessential David Hockney style. Things are kind of they're sort of in, they're sort of in perspective, but not really. You have the nice elongated strokes, like no jittery lines, nice use of color, just amazing. Um, he says here, I intend to carry on with my work, which is now I see as very important. Uh, he says, we have two, we have lost touch with nature rather foolishly as we are part of it, not outside it. This will in time be over. And then what? What have we learned? I am 83 years old. I will die. The cause of death is birth. The only real things in life are food, love, and in that order. Just like our little dog, Ruby. I really believe this, and the source of art is love. I love life, which definitely I love. A great message from him. Beautiful images from David Hockney. Again, I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out yourself. But it is it makes you think, innit? If there is going to be a change in attitude towards nature when all this stuff settles down and everyone gets back to normal. Will people just go back to... Will people just go back to how it was before and not give a shit? Or will there be like a little bit of a... Because what you'd want, right, is you'd want in general, I think, I think, um, let me, yeah, let's say this for once. I think people, is it probably, it's probably a fair assumption to say that people in New York, I say the Middle Eastern population or people who are, who look like they practice Islam or, right, or practicing Muslim, sorry. I bet they have a much better time in New York post 9-11 than they did before, right? There's there's some sort of like residual of after effects of like being chastised in the street, being called a terrorist, and suddenly people start to you know develop a bit of compassion. They start to understand about the different regions in Saudi Arabia. They start to realize oh not everybody in Saudi Arabia or not everybody in the Middle East is actually Muslim. They have different sort of sex, different sort of religious um religious leanings, and then it gets people to understand the people that live around them, and then it changes the conversation a little bit. So your hope is that. Even if there is a bit of grace period, even if there is a little bit of a honeymoon period where everyone's outside and hugging each other and letting an old lady go in front of you in the queue to keeping the social distancing. You're hoping that even though some of the, that stuff might erode over time, people might just start getting snarky and annoyed on the central line as they were previously. You're going to hope the residual effects will kind of um, will be felt for like years to come and people will be a little bit more aware of their surroundings and won't take things for granted and one thing i think is going to happen quite often i've been looking at it myself is that i think there's going to be a lot of migrating of especially people that are my age or so people in my generation let's say from the generation of like for the time that you can probably leave home and you've got the means to let's say from the age of like 25 to 45 i think it's going to be a big migration of people leaving places like london and going to like smaller cities or smaller towns outside of london or in like you know in the middle of the uk um places in scotland republic of ireland northern ireland i think there's going to be a big change i can definitely see it happening because what we've seen with this whole pandemic is that most people don't need to work in a physical office i think there could be an argument to be had for some people lobbying their employers to re- allow them to work permanently via like a work from home request where they maybe have to come in once a week or once every week once like two two weeks out of the month and then you kind of review it as you go along so there might be a complete cultural shift in terms of how people approach work which also then approach how they approach life in it because you know work and life are sort of like synony- synonymous of each other they go hand in hand so that might be a good way to go about things and if you're going to move out to the countryside you're going to move out to nature you're going to have to go out there and experience it. And it's going to change the way you kind of interact with your surroundings, how you buy, how you shop, um, the things you take for granted, the things you don't take for granted. It will change everything, I think. Because even now, like, who's buying fashion? Who's buying clothes? Who's going out there and spending money on frivolous things or wasting money on that? Or like, you know, it's it's all, it's kind of flipped it around. It's kind of made it a really more interesting kind of way to go about things. And again, maybe we might adopt the kind of Mediterranean thing, right? Where people enjoy a lot more spending time at home with their friends having a drink and getting smashed right then they do going out and spending money at a bar right it's the idea that it's the actual people that you're with is that's important it's not where you go so the idea of going to a cocktail bar and wasting a lot of money you know to sit by a candlelit table somewhere um in the musty pubs listening to really trendy songs isn't that important you want to be surrounded by your mates so that might change the way people deal with it you never know man but regardless of that um this is a welcome respite from david hockney i really recommend you check it out and I thought it would be a good way to start the podcast instead of, you know, going into the doom and gloom straight away. But some really amazing, beautifully done paintings from the legend that is David Hockney. Um, really well done, really nicely done. And then again, um, yeah, I recommend you check it out one of the animated videos to see how, what that looks like.
what happens here is animated what happens is it just fill up oh cool the sky is moving in the background that's really really cool man i really recommend you check it out i think it's awesome i think i'm plugging my headphones because i'm not plugging we'll see what else happens but yeah good stuff all around let's move on um what else we have a list to talk about here? Movie stuff I did. Oh, so um, our man Joe Exotic. I'm sure most people have watched the Tiger Do- Tiger King documentary, and you've all have your opinions as to who is guilty, who is not guilty. Um, one thing is for sure with these things, you watch them, and mo- more likely than not, I try not to form an opinion based on what you see in the documentary because you know, the person that's putting it together, the director, the producer, they're effectively storytellers, right? It's essentially like a it's essentially like um a little bit more of it's essentially an extended version of a reality tv show right they want to present to you what they want to present to you um even i've heard people that are in documentaries who've told the producer or the filmmaker one version of the story and then when they see it in post or they see in production it's completely different narrative so you can't necessarily take anything from it you can't glean anything what you can say from the facts of what you have available is that Jerry Exotic has come out of it like you know an absolute you know character he's absolutely took any celebrity to another level we obviously have the impression that he's a you know uh you know your kind of quintessential narcissist somebody who was kind of um very much looking forward to the day when he could become a celebrity um, outside of the stuff he was doing in his kind of animal sanctuary or his quote unquote zoo and now he's finally got his wish but unfortunately he's got it whilst he's behind bars right it's the double whammy of having to of having you know finally achieved your no try that you want but also knowing that you're going to be spending the most of your time most of your life in prison for an alleged hit that he put on one of his um one of his um sworn enemies that carol has a carol or caroline whatever her name is in the documentary but there's one section of it someone uploaded which is a very poignant because it speaks about what we've kind of been going through now with the coronavirus and in terms of what the government tells you in terms of how they you know this disease was or this virus sorry it was getting spoken about in you know with caution and with trepidation from like december i'm gonna say right when we heard news of the doctor in china supposedly getting you know annexed because he decided to speak up and say something was going on with this coronavirus right but the experts told you not to worry right they said it was nothing to really get that annoyed about they didn't they didn't give us any precautions they didn't tell us to wear face masks from that day so that we could just kind of stem the flow and now suddenly it's kind of gone into overdrive and now they're telling us and imploring us to stay inside they're you know bailing out their buddies they're not providing adequate care um there's not enough ppe going around at the hospitals and the care facilities it's all a complete mess right so they've essentially got caught with their pants down and now they're employing us with their hand held out or begging us on tv to kind of help them out and make sure things go well and again i'm hoping once everything gets to settle down and, and you know everything's back to normal that we don't forget how much shit they put us in right and the damage that they've caused because essentially you know we vote them into power we have the ability to kick them out in some cases not all but in some and i thought this message from jay just definitely spoke to it and i'm gonna play it here for you guys to listen to it here in this country when we have somebody that's been declared a domestic terrorist that is too political to prosecute when the hell is it right to crawl in somebody's place poison animals burn shit down Walk on sidewalks in California, anywhere else in the country, and throwing red paint on people just because they choose to wear a fur coat. Amen. There is nothing free about this goddamn country anymore. It's all about who you pay and who you know. Uh, Let me move on to a senator by the name of John Thune. You know the worst thing he can do is lay in bed and an alarm clock goes off and the Today Show's playing and all you see is mayhem murder and bullshit and when i'm talking about bullshit i'm talking about the politicians and the shit that's going on here in america now we're gonna have some senator named john thune that's gonna introduce some bill to make it illegal for a business to be able to sue somebody for putting a false review on yelp or trip advisor let me give you a little education mister first of all you people up there in washington and the white house and the senates and the congress and everything else you need to work four years and then you need to get out and get a real fucking job so you know what's going on in the business world in america let me tell you something i've been self-employed for over the last 35 years and i'm out here in the real world and i know what's right or wrong or bullshit or you can scoop it with a scoop shovel 
You know what the problem is with online trip advisor and Yelp and all that other bullshit? First thing is, is you fire an employee and what do they do? They get a vendetta against you. So they get on the internet and they post all this negative shit about your business online and you can't get it off of there. The second thing is, is you got people just like that rescue facility down there in Florida and the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries that's all fucking jealous of what anybody else is doing. And this is all about getting donations shoved over to your facility if you can badmouth somebody else. So what do they do? They get all their employees, all their volunteers, and all the people that like them online to go over to your trip advisor and your internet sites and start putting bad reviews on there that Jesus Christ, your animals are starving, your cages are dirty, the place looks like shit, the people are rude, and there ain't a goddamn thing you can do about it. What you need to do instead of introducing a law to protect them motherfuckers, you need to introduce a law to protect the people that are paying your fucking wages. I don't. Hundred percent true, and you can't you can't necessarily say anything more than that, can you? But one thing that kind of intrigued me about the documentary was that there was a lack of talk about drugs. They kind of mention obviously meth. You obviously saw the guy on there who's got the, you know, he's got the complete meth mouth, you know, his whole teeth were missing, which I didn't know that was a thing, meth mouth, but, you know, it makes complete sense. But there was a real lack of acknowledgement of just how much drugs played a factor into this whole episode of Joe Exotic, you know. He was able to turn out two guys through it. He was able to essentially plot the revenge killing of one of his competitors and essentially wind up in jail just because of that, all that stuff. And again, but. They're probably high-functioning drug addicts in that regard because they're able to run a successful business and you know keep the punters coming in week in week out without any real delay. So that's probably a credit to them in that regard. But if you haven't checked it out, and I'm sure the whole world has seen it by now because all the celebrities are talking about it. But definitely an amazing documentary and definitely something that kind of opened my eyes in terms of understanding what the people in the south are actually like, right? What that kind of uh, swamp persons are. You hear a lot of it, swamp people in the swamp, people from the swamp. And they're a lot more, I think from watching stuff like Fargo, you realise, isn't it? Especially how they depict that kind of like Midwestern, um, easygoing, laid back sort of individual where they kind of look, they kind of play dumb. They, I think it's one of the 40 laws of power, isn't it, right? Act dumber than what you actually are. So they uh, they have this appearance of being a little bit dopey and a little bit dim-witted, but they're really clever, really conniving. And if you fuck around with them, you know, you could get fucked up for real, especially in their kind of climate, on their landscape or in their kind of backyard. That's not the right thing to do, but definitely recommend you check that. Let's move on here. Um, we've got, we got, should we talk about, what have we got? No, we must talk about Gates because that's, that's going to make me bummed out. But Jack Grealish, Jack Grealish decided to go out and get pissed because he was bored, right? The coronavirus is impacting everyone in a different way. I think you're seeing now that even though no one wants to admit it and no one wants not to admit it, but no one wants to like um, it's not it's not a valid excuse because no one has any sympathy for people of that have considerable amounts of wealth. But essentially, what you're seeing is that rich people or people of notoriety are as normal as you and I, right? They are also bored. I'm not. Don't get me wrong, because I'm an you know I'm an introvert. I'm the I'm the actual I'm right at the edge of the introvert um scale. And I'm enjoying the fact that I've got time to sit at home, read, not get disturbed, um, watch documentaries, write, draw, all these good stuff that I enjoy doing anyway. I can just do it at full tilt with no distractions. That's pretty amazing. But for some of from other people who don't have that kind of personality or who aren't who are a bit more extroverted, who, who just like hanging out with their friends, right? For, for lack of a better term, they're really struggling. And this whole epidemic has shown us, or pandemic, whatever has showed us that they are just the same as me and you. But unfortunately, with everything that's going on with the severity of the issues with people actually dying because of asymptomatic people who are going out not knowing they're carrying and you know the gallivanting around they're putting people who are at risk at the risk of dying right and that's not something that you can really um uh take lightly and unfortunately jack Grealish, who potentially could have been a target for manchester united the team that i support got himself in a bit of hot bother the other day because he decided to venture out um, to go visit his friends or to go get pissed up because he thought it was a good idea, right? So this is the headline. It says, Aston Villa footballer Jack Grealish is sorry and deeply embarrassed for ignoring lockdown. It says the following here. It says, Aston Villa captain has issued a public apology after he stupidly agreed to go to a friend's house this weekend in violation of a coronavirus lockdown. Jack Grealish uh, posted a video message on Twitter saying he was deeply embarrassed by his actions, which he saw the police called on Sunday. The 24-year-old footballer had on Saturday... Saturday afternoon posted a video urging people to stay in, right? So this is a, so which is kind of um it kind of you know reminds me of this reminds me of you know those um 
preach you know those politicians in america who are vehemently against same-sex marriage right um they don't want people they don't want people the same sex to get hooked up they they think it's a sin they call you all sorts of names sodom and gomorrah abomination blah blah they wish basically wish death upon you more likely than not those same politicians are the same ones where a week or two later it get a story breaks where they are involved in the most and it's never just oh this guy was at a gay bar it's always the most incredibly lewd story like this guy was bending over his assistant in his office when his assistant when he's a pa walked in or something on them or he was strung out on drugs like that senator and um that democratic senator that was strung out on drugs with his you know completely naked um overdosing with a couple of male prostitutes right it's never the, it's never like a, a, a kind of like uh pg story like oh he thought he was holding hands with some guy that he's a relationship for four years no it's always some like crazy sex and drugs fueled um scandal that they're involved in so whenever you see someone being too pious or being a little bit too altruistic out in front of you and being all oh i'm so perfect like similar to that woman that woman from fucking tiger king right there's something fishy about her because she's if, even if they're imagine if everything joe's was saying was not true there's no way that she's not a little bit conniving a little bit sneaky right she presents herself as a complete angel but you know that's not true and people like that you have to worry about the most because they've got you know they've got the most crazy skeletons underneath their floorboard so when you see a video of somebody like this right talking about you staying in and being all sincere and somber you have to be wary to help save lives you must stay at mm -hmm. home only leave your house to buy food to buy medicine or to exercise and always remember to stay at least two meters apart this is urgent Protect the NHS, stay home, save lives. And you know what? During the two exercise, me running, I've never seen this many people outside running in my whole entire life living in the place I live in in London. Never have I seen it. So all these part time um, coronavirus runners are annoying me and, taking, and just taking up valuable running space when I'm chilling out on the streets or when I'm kind of sliding all over the streets. I want to sprint all over the streets. It's so annoying, isn't it? These people were never around before. Where, did, where were these guys when I was running? Nowhere. Now all of a sudden, everyone's a fucking jogger annoying but yeah so he, he releases that and also continues says less than 48 hours after he shared his warning message Grealish was caught ignoring the government's and his own advice West Midlands police said that they were contacted just before 10 a.m on Sunday to report that a Range Rover had crashed into two parked cars in Solihull the stationary cars were left with man damages so this is his obviously his car right a white Range Rover Sport now there's loads of holes to pick in the story number one he's a well-known footballer number one two he plays for Aston Villa which isn't the most glamorous club but in Birmingham I'm assuming he's very well known I'm assuming people know where he lives. They assume they know what car he drives. So he's not the most inconspicuous person that you would see in that area. So for him to think he could go out and do this is just insane. Um, you would probably think he'd be a little bit more clever, maybe get jump in an Uber or something and go do it with his mates that way. But no, he doesn't. And then you have to also think about his friends. Who are his friends that he has around him who think it's a good idea to encourage? Because that's the thing I don't really understand sometimes with footballers. Maybe because some of the people they hang around with are quote-unquote celebrities in their own little right right due to being kind of well known in the in the hood they live in maybe well known in a club scene maybe well known because they're an agent or manager but i'm always surprised why a lot of these footballers who get in trouble don't have more friends in their social group who are who treat the footballer as the as the a player that like that's the person that you need to protect at all costs like for instance, Christian and other friends are pretty like that. Like you, see, you get the opinion of Christian and has got entourage of his brother and some family members and nephews and other friends that he has who are all up, who for sure, for the most part, they're all Portuguese. But the, those friends that he kind of grew up with or they're around him, they look after Ronaldo. He's the Christian the main dude. So they make sure that if they're going to pick up, if they're going to go to a really dodgy part of town, if they're going to get hammered somewhere, they make sure that he's the guy that, is looked after no matter what so that re probably requires having two people in the, in the group or in the entourage who are relatively sober who've got their you know who on their p's and q's who have everything sorted out who've got the whole itinerary done they've got the fixer they've got the the, the person's going to take them from a to b they're in a club where no phones are allowed they're they're on it so that that person that they're protecting could just let loose and be you know have a lot of fun i'd imagine that's what it's like which is probably why a lot of celebrities don't like to have new people in their circle right they don't want that to make new friends because you never know who's gonna rat you out to the daily mail or something but you just wonder like who are get checking his friends who are these people that are allowing him who are encouraging him to come over to have a drink that's just not on in it that's just a really bizarre way to do things and yeah i just i don't know that's the thing that i just can't get my head, head around right and then again if you're gonna do it do it clever in a clever fashion and 
that's the thing that I think a lot of these European footballers, especially the continental ones, have over the British based players is that there's no denying that players from the members of the Real Madrid team, Barcelona, you know, Juventus, Atletico Madrid, Paris Saint Germain, there's no there's no denying that those guys get on it, right? They go out, they have fun, they get wasted. But they do it in a way that requires 100% professionalism. They do it in a way that I think Dennis Rodman said, I think the story of Dennis Rodman is like that, right? There's legendary Dennis Rodman stories of him going out with somebody, um, him drinking that person under the bar, and then that person seeing Dennis Rodman the next day, you know, throwing up 40 in the match of Chicago Bulls, right? Because he's a consummate professional. Because he knows in his head he's got that switch that if he decides to go out, there is nothing in his, there is no... There's no scenario where he can allow himself to phone in sick or to say he can't come and he can't allow it because if he wants to continue unabetted going to strip clubs and going to dive bars, he has to be able to split his activities in two or split his, you know, his kind of responses in two. Like one way I react when I go out, one way I react when I go to go training. You, dig, you can't let one thing impact the other. So I guess if you're obviously, to make life easier, it would be better to just be completely sober once you're playing. And then when you're not, just go out and get high and do, do what you want to do. But if you're going to mix the two worlds, you have to be able to just turn up. You have to be able to just show up and be professional and no one can know. And you have to be in a position where you're not crashing into parked cars at 10 a.m. in the morning because that proves that you might have been doing more than just drinking, right? That asks the question, like, who's up at 10 a.m. in the morning drinking alcohol? You're probably doing other things as well, which isn't um, something that you want to see. I guess everyone knows it's happening, but you don't want to see it, especially if you're a sports fan, especially if you're a f- fan, especially if you're a supporter of Aston Villa, right? I think they're, st- what, are they still second from bottom at the moment? Do you really want your captain, your star man doing that? What do Aston Villa do now? They want to sell this player. They're stripping him of his captain's arm, armband. Does that affect the price of the club and how going to get for you when they're going to sell you one? Like, you're harming so many people's lives by doing that cruelly selfish kind of decision. But let's continue anyway. Um, it says here, police said the driver left his details with a member of the public but then left the scene. The fool said that they will be following up with the driver. Photos emerged on Sunday of a damaged white image of a sport and a picture of what appeared to be a footballer mismatched slippers and shorts. On Monday, Chris took the Twitter again second video and it says it's apologize for what happened <laughs> hi everybody um i just want to do a quick video message just to say how deeply embarrassed i am by about what has happened this weekend um i know it's a tough time for everyone at the moment been locked indoors for so long and i obviously just got a call off a friend um asking to go around to his uh, and i stupidly agreed to do so um I don't want anyone to make the same mistake that I did, so I obviously urge everyone to stay at home and, and follow the rules and the guidelines of what we've been asked to do. Um, I know for a fact that I'll be doing that in the near future now, and obviously, like I said, I urge everyone to do the same. Um, I hope everyone can accept my apology and uh, we can move on from this, and hopefully, obviously, in the near future, we can all be out enjoying ourselves again um, once this is all um, boiled over. <laughs> but it's interesting though thinking about it I was just listening to all this him to kind of apologise but it's the, profes- the the professionalism thing in the UK especially maybe it's the UK it's not really a, an international thing I think for the most part I look at someone like Antonio Cassano you know anytime he kind of kicked a fuss and made a fool out of himself the club and especially Serie A club just got rid of him straight away but American sports or especially American football they don't really fuck around, do they? Antonio Brown still hasn't got a club, still hasn't got a team now at the moment, right? Even though he's probably one of the best um, wide receivers out there in the game, right? Some people would say maybe the best on his day. But teams just don't take any chances because much like, which is weird because I think American football is quite similar to U- the UK in that, in that regard or in soccer in general, especially in some of the bigger European leagues. For the most part, you know, you could throw a, you could throw a rock out your window and you could hit someone that can play football, right? Especially in the UK. Like, everyone goes up playing football as their main sport. And there's a bevy of talented players who haven't made it who are playing in the lower leagues. There's a bevy of players who haven't made it who are not playing in any leagues. So it's not like you're short on a talent that's available to you. Maybe it might cost you a little bit more to develop or time and all that stuff, but you can get football players. So sometimes I wonder why a lot of these teams put up with players who are quite clearly not on their A game outside of football, right? They're kind of letting things slide. They're kind of a bit of self-sabotage. They're self-sabotages in, in the way that I'm, I've been in self-sabotage in my own career and things that I've done. They, I, I, regard, I wonder why they, they allow that to happen. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean 
because for instance that Jack Grealish is a great player don't get me wrong but like, if you're a big club like United or if your aspirations to once again be at that level or even if you're just a Man City or you're an Arsenal like perhaps someone, someone that Arteta is a good example right he's come in and people have said he's a bit of a he's a bit of a authoritarian right he has rules and he has standards and he demands a the, the the utmost professionalism from his players he whipped them all into shape he kind of saw things that were going a bit right Arsenal and kind of just really sw- um kind of cracked the whip for lack of a better term would you really want to disturb that culture that sanctuary you built up by bringing in someone like a Jack Grealish who might kind of influence the squad negatively you don't want that really do you that's not what you want you want your star players to be professional on and off the pitch or if they're going to go and get you know, wasted. You don't want to hear about it. That's all you, that's, you hear about Christian Ronaldo, same thing, I'm at United, like, all the people that you think would have hated him, like Roy Keane and Paul Scholes, loved him because as flashy as he was, as, you know, self-absorbed as he was, when it came to training, when it came to match days, he was always the most professional, he was always punctual, he'd always turn up in full kits, he'd always turn up and give 110%, would always stay behind after training sessions to do extra work. He took it very, very seriously and I think, that's something that isn't really talked. That's why people probably give people like Jordan Henderson such a, um, they probably give him a lot more grace than they would have somebody else because for somebody of his talent level, he does carry himself like a world-class player. Like he treats football very seriously. He takes his training very seriously. Um, he's very analytical. He does, he does, he, he watches a lot of film I've heard, right? He's always going over his technique, trying to improve. And if you've seen him from Sunderland to what he's at Liverpool, he's improved tenfold. So you think of something like a Jack Grealish who probably has more natural ability than a Jordan Henderson. But is he really going to be able to achieve what he has done if he's got this sort of tendency to do this at, at this level now? And he's only 20, he's at 24 and he's playing at Savannah's like this. Imagine when he gets you know, 100,000 a week and he's playing for United or he's playing for Arsenal or he's playing for Chelsea. What's it going to be like then, right? Especially in the bigger cities or, you know, with more distractions around him, more influence. It's just not the right way to go about things. And again, you can't blame him specifically only. I think there is a part of it where you also have to kind of blame his friends. You need friends in your group or you need, or maybe that's the difference. Maybe because he's not playing with top players, right? There's never this kind of, because he can just turn up kind of hungover and still be the best player on the pitch. Because he's not playing with top players, he probably let something slack a little bit maybe that's part of it i don't know but it's disappointing to see it might affect his overall chances of getting a big move to a club at united um it obviously is going to hurt aston villa too for their kind of wanting to sell him on and get a lot of money for him but what can you do man but again stupid decision to make i think it also shows the differences in the in the, um in kind of approach or coverage imagine if this was paul pogba somebody who they kind of went after time and time again in the press if he did the same thing, what would be happening? So, you know, there is a little bit of a... People, no one wants to admit it, but there is a bias in terms of the way they treat British players, especially British players of a certain skin colour, which is disappointing because I think Jack Creech has got quite a few of these misdemeanors on his rap sheet, right? I think there's a picture of him kind of strung out on the floor. Is that posed? I'm not sure if it's posed. I do remember him getting involved in that. Obviously, he's got the obviously he's got the standard blowing into a helium balloon picture that every footballer has, so I'm not going to um, get him on him for that, but... It's not a really good sign, is it? I'm a big fan of his. I really want him at United. I think he's a bit of a character. He has a bit of swagger about him. He probably he obviously thinks he's better than what he is, which is something that you need in a play of the of his level, right? Somebody that's obviously going to go there and kind of uh, grab the ball by the horns and really kind of take the ownership of trying to be a Man United player and go from there. But I don't know if you want that kind of personality in the dressing room. Somebody who's going to, you know, want to get wasted because you qualify for the Europa League. That's not really what you want in it. You want winners that are going to just win, just keep doing it season in, season in, season in, season out. That's the mark of a true kind of champion or winner. But again, I'm just it's just curious to me why English football clubs tend to give players more of a more leniency or a bit more forgiving when other countries aren't you know if you're not doing it off the pitch you're not doing it on the pitch or if you're not doing it off the pitch it could really impact the time chances you get to play they don't really fuck around with that but i don't know maybe it's just um a cultural thing in it or maybe it's a training thing too as much as there is a lot of football players to pick from you don't want to be wasting your time doing that all the time and i don't know who knows but anyway let's move on there's a video here from sun waves of people raving that got me really um because i because i thinking of this whole thing right i'm not really missing people i have to be honest i'm not like i don't really give a shit about that i can be inside for a long time but i'm actually missing just being in a rave just around people i'm not missing anyone but i'm missing being around people um you know the sound of the bass right 
the speakers going boom, 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 here, overhearing conversations that you might buy into and just, oh my God, she, you know, track, yeah, no, the, the, seeing someone with a cool shirt, someone contem- contemplating, uh, complimenting your cool shirt, the lights, um, the DJs behind the booth, the hangers on, right? Like all of that I'm missing, even just the, the walk up to, to the door, right? queuing for entry the cloakroom it's just i'm missing all of that that's the thing that i'm missing the most and this video here that somebody uploaded from some waves in 2019 with martin brothers and seth Troxler definitely gives me that kind of vibes of course for some people it's not going to be your type of rave i know it's not your type of festival it's a really popular festival in romania that i'm, I'm ricardo villalobos made famous because he i think this is where he might have co-signed um what's his name Oh, not not zip not zap what's his fucking name i forgot his name here but he co-signed one of the guys from him from all that whole crew rarish and a few others he co-signed them when he was there for the first time and then that kind of took them to the next level and it's kind of from then on it's kind of gone on to become one of the big kind of uh, festivals or events during the whole festival season and yeah this video kind of encapsulates that for the most part <laughs> it's a kind of similar it's like a dc10 crowd it looks i don't know if there's just like overly male population in romania for the most part but it's mostly dudes with their phones up recording and shit and then you've got the, obviously the quintessential tent roof that you see on all the videos on songs that's what i don't remember from seeing videos from ricardo lobos on back in the day <laughs> So that's what I missed the most about it. just the kind of you know hands in the air the bass thumping um everyone having a good time and again you're you're hoping the landscape returns you're hoping it kind of oh, i don't know if it's going to be a change that's the big debate in it whether or not a lot of these smaller independent venues will still be around once everything kind of settles down that's up for debate but i think something i've been thinking about the other day is that even if they don't hang around that we just have the kind of mid to higher capacity clubs available I think they're still going to be the position where they probably can't afford to get, you know, the top 50 years from RA list or poll to come down and play. They're still going to require a lot of the mid and lower level guys and girls to play just to kind of just to kind of tie them over until they're able to get some sort of money through the door. But I think that will be a good opportunity and also give uh, it'll be a good opportunity for the DJs themselves who don't usually play at that place to get a chance to play because they've got no other option they have to pick the kind of cheap option and also be a chance for the dj themselves to kind of show and prove and show that they can play on that level because i think it's similar to football i think there's a lot of players in championship who can obviously play in the premier league but a lot of premier league clubs aren't willing to take the chance right because even though a championship player might be cheaper than buying a player on the continent, it depends if they're British based, but let's say even if they they're uh, they are guaranteed they're kind of like like for like, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna wanna go to somebody who's basically proved it for longer, maybe playing in a higher division, quote unquote, on paper, because your job's on the line, right? And I think a lot of these clubs are the same. A lot of these clubs, especially the bar owners or the event managers, I think a lot of their KPIs are basically um, you know, really come down to who comes through the door you know if you get hired in may and your first june your first event your first event is in june but it's not as well attended as the event of the other of your predecessor in april you're going to be in for a hard time in your job and it? it's going to be um it's going to be really uh squeaky bum time so you can't allow yourself to be in a position where like hopefully it works out you can't book an underground DJ you just found on soundcloud someone that emailed you in you have to pick your friends who you know 
um, what they can do. And you also have to pick the people who are kind of tried and tested, right? Who've kind of been there before in your city. We've kind of done the numbers. You know, you can promote the fuck out of it online. They've got a good social media game. All that sort of shit is going to play into it. But I think in, in dire straits, because they won't have a lot of options available to them, a lot of these events owners, a lot of these, sorry, uh, bookers and event plans will just have to make do with what's available. And you're hoping that works. The other scenario is that a lot of the smaller ones stay around or stay alive just because they're able to kind of, you know, like I mentioned before, they're able to maybe um, utilize their spaces for like live streaming events, hire it out for radio DJs to come in or DJs to come and record their mixes, like similar to like a pirate radio. Imagine if you could do that. Imagine if clubs offered up their spaces during the day, um, like time slots, you could go in and record your set in their nightclub, like a pirate radio station, and then be able to stream it live show people and have that as part of your reel right off part of your cv that'd be pretty cool wouldn't it obviously not everyone could do it it could probably be, you could probably price it out so you make sure you only get good people playing i don't know it doesn't really matter really it's just like a little money on her that way they could stay they could stay afloat so then once the doors open they, they could then because i think uh, it was that kind of booking of the top 50 djs was also seeping into a lot of the un underground kind of smaller clubs because they got to a point where they just had to make money so i think now because people are going to be more open to maybe because you're you're hoping this is all kind of under the assumption that people will want to go out once everything's settled down it might not be like that people might just get people might just be afraid for a year and not come out at all right and then you know it's a whole different conversation but if people decide to kind of you know um keep calm and carry on right the kind of uh the british mantra right if they decide to kind of adopt that kind of myth or that kind of um ideology then it could potentially see there being more people out than there are clubs available to to accommodate them and if that's the case it gives these people who throw these kind of you know um independent underground kind of events a chance to really be crafty and do something a little bit different you know um really try to offer something a little bit interesting and the best way to do that is to book people who aren't necessarily well known and give them a platform to shine that allows them to bring in their friends you build a real community there a real scene because you know you're that imagine you, you book this girl that no one knows from east ham and she smashes it right and then she suddenly brings in all her friends who have been supporting her for ages but they never saw her given a chance on that kind of level she's gonna she's gonna owe the world to you right they're gonna be so loyal to you because you gave them the opportunity and it also allows you to brag about it because if then that person becomes the next nina kravitz you can say you were the first person to give her a chance so it kind of works both ways i don't really see the, the kind of the risk in it really but i don't know a lot of these people a lot of it is money and a lot of it comes down to the fact that there's a lot of money at, at, on the line a lot of these clubs they can't afford to just go out and just book some underground person on soundcloud i know but i'm hoping with the stuff happening now it's definitely changed people's view on how to kind of do these things and there's a lot more of a different kind of take on how to do it properly but this video definitely made me catch the feels Can't go wrong with Seth Johnson and Martin Brothers. Look at that. I think you missed that, right? Oh, there's a black guy there. Madness, I was about to say, the black guy's got to remain you. There is, yeah, there's one there. Madness, that's sick. cool man but yeah that's gonna be a long time until we're there again aren't we friends <laughs> so let's not look at that too much um let's carry on here what else we got to talk about um So supposedly Mike Skinner is collaborating with Tame Impala. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Um, obviously, you know, Mike Skinner is a legend, but he hasn't necessarily 
done everything that I've kind of felt lately as as of late. But this collaboration could be interesting. Is is it called, is it called social distancing? I'm not too sure. Um, but he just announced it on his uh, Instagram now at the moment. It's a little video so that kind of speaks on it. But yeah, that album, um, Slow Rush, man. I've just <sighs> nowadays I think you get the feeling, especially with a lot of albums, that they're, they're quite disposable, right? Or they're very of the moment. You listen to it for like a six. M- it's like, do you remember um? What was the song with DJ Khaled and Rihanna and Bryson Tiller? Um, with the Maria Maria sample, it it kind of, that was an epitome of kind of modern day music where it kind of it kind of was very on for the moment it came out. Then as soon as that moment passed, it was done. And I remember because I was DJing a lot at that time, especially in Westfield Stratford, and I was um, especially in the shopping mall, sorry, in Westfield Stratford, and I was remembering that when I first played it, it would really have a lot of resonance. Then when you, each each successive week, and I played it, it started to feel a lot more past its sell by day i just felt a little bit cheap by playing it maybe it's just me being a snob but it, it kind of just i don't know it kind of just whittled away and i think a lot of modern music is like that i'm not too sure why but it's just a thing so i'm so when something like taming part of slow rush comes out i played it you know I, I can't remember the amount of times i've kind of played this on my phone especially out during runs um some of my favorite tracks on here are probably I'm gonna say you're my favorite track on the album. See, I've got I've got all of them on there. If you can see that on the screen, right? All of the flipping albums on there, and then Slow Rush is down the bottom, right? So I don't know what my most. I'm not sure if you could show what your most played song is on there. It doesn't show you, but um, without a shadow of a doubt, right? Because I've got a couple of doubles on there. One of my favorite ones is not really spoken about too much. Is Tomorrow's Dust, especially the second half of it. Let's see if I can get that up on here. Second half of tomorrow's dust. Yeah, this this one. Like that one, and then what was the other one? I think is it on track? Is that one? Is that dub 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 dub? What was it true? Yeah, that this is one of my favorite ones. Is it true? Is one of my favorite ones as well. And it's towards the end of it here. This bit. absolutely legendary stuff so let's see what happens when uh, the streets uh, or Matt Skinner and Tammy Impala link up there's a video from Instagram sort of speaking on it Call and, call and I wonder if it would be a collaboration tape or if it would just be like um I hope it's a collaboration tape and I hope it's not the same as fucking, you know, the Skepta and Chipmunk and the um, Young Ads mixtape. Those collaboration tapes are always a bit garbage, especially when they don't spend time working together and putting it, you know, putting the pieces in place. They just email tracks back and forth, it never works out. But if this is an actual collaboration project or a single, I can see it working out pretty good. Um, so far, you know, my skin is vocals on a Tame Impala produced beat sounds pretty interesting. I'm not sure if it is that way. Maybe it might be um, at Tame Impala doing the arrangement or just doing some of the songwriting, but it could work out really well. They, they don't really match in terms of voice tonality. You kind of get a feeling that, you know, maybe my skin would work better with like a James Blake, you know, for lack of a better uh, example. Um, but you know it never it, it could work you could see a kind of a flowery uh, skipping through uh, daffodils uh, my skinner um, on because I, I, I don't really think when I think of my skin I think of cat I don't think of LSD <laughs> you know that's the thing if you're talking about drugs my skinner is cat and Tammy Parler's LSD so let's see if this works out but interesting to see what the what the results will be once it's announced but this is just a little post from him earlier today so I'm not sure if we're going to hear any more dates on the announcement but let's keep abreast on that one if that is the case let's continue here what else do we have to talk about um we have an interesting interview actually with rihanna on vogue which was really cool and made me love her more than you know most people obviously everyone loves her so i'm not going to say that but a really cool cover number one because you know you've got rihanna on the cover of vogue with a do-rag on which i think is pretty amazing you've got her wearing obviously um the quintessential i think it's british vogue too so it makes sense because it got burberry on the front there designed by ricardo tishi long time collaborator of rihanna and yeah it's a really cool interview it kind of speaks about what her views are on music she's obviously going back to making a new tune a new album sorry so she's working um, really hard on that i like that don't she mentioned in the interview that 
she's trying not to she doesn't like the idea of themes on interview which is very or the themed albums which is very interesting I'm, my, some of my favorite albums are themed right especially you know think of the old Leonard Skinner albums and you think of something like Kendrick Lamar's done you think of stuff that you know even something like Drake has done like some of the better artists are able to kind of paint a picture through the music they do and it kind of you know you kind of visualize in your head i think of something like after hours of the weekend's a good idea behind it. you can play out the entire film from the beginning to the end and it kind of fits it in the whole anthology of their previous or the whole discography the whole catalog kind of fits in with that project nothing sort of stands out by its own the only person who i kind of give a blind to that is some of the trap rappers right they just make tracks and they put them all together in an album and just put them out there but i think when you're like a pop star mega star like ariana sometimes it's your best suited to kind of take advantage of the fact that you have the ability to put out what you want and people are going to lap it up so why not just take a risk and make a themed album and then slip in a couple pop hits here and there right that's what you should be doing but she's really kind of flipping the script and saying nah fuck the themes i'm just going to make what i like and then select what i like from it and put it in an album which is you know interesting i'm not sure if it's going to go down as well as she hopes it does because people are looking forward to an album but then maybe people, maybe she's thinking people actually don't want albums; they want music. I like the fact that she's also trying not to be de- dictated by her fans. I think Bob didn't suffer from that a bit, didn't he? Right? I think that's what he written Chronicles that like he suffered from having to kind of answer to his fans about his art, his work, and that's what they, that's. I think most artists or most people of prominent level say that you should never be responding to your fans. You should be giving them what you think is you want to give them at that set time because if you start responding to them, you get caught in this loop where you're just repeating your greatest hits and not sexually evolving. And for the most part, your fans might not know what they like. No, your no, your fans might not might not might come around to what you do later on, right? So you kinda of owe it to them to kind of push the envelope and then let them catch up later and then, you know, kinda of continue on. But the fact that you, sh- you shouldn't be kind of um, allowing them to dictate your art- artistry. So I thought that was interesting. Um, let me see if I can get up on here. Actually find the kind of quote on album. What was it? Da, 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 da. What was it? Is it? And I say, is it a theme in it? Themes. Yeah, there we go. So here's her talking about it, right? So I'll quickly, I'll speak about that one. Da, 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 da. So, um, and I think the 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 big up the whoever wrote the article too um where's this lady i think it's a lady right um afua hirsch definitely a really really well written article you can tell this person is a huge rihanna fan which is amazing because a lot of times you get interviewers who do these interviews with big artists and it seems like they're they, they're kind of they kind of have contempt for the person they're interviewing they don't really enjoy being in their company they're just doing it because their publication sent them out to do a field piece which is super annoying but you definitely get the feeling reading this that this person is in love with Rihanna as much as anyone else is and just really gushing at the opportunity to be in the same environment as the as her sitting in the same office smelling her all this sort of stuff it's a really it's a really descriptive kind of love letter to Rihanna Reiske from a stand but I like this bit here so here the following it says um here of all places at her record company's offices it's hard to ignore the small matter of her next music project nicknamed r9 because it will be her ninth album the absence of a delay of which has been tirelessly debated by her army of stands the navy she says i can't say when i'm going to drop she says and it couldn't even it could even be by the time this read it but of course not but i'm very aggressively but i'm very aggressively working on music and it continues what can we expect i don't want my albums to feel like themes Okay, which I like. She she says, taking a sip of wine. There are no rules. There are no. F- there's no format. There's just good music. And if I feel like it, um, and if I feel it, I'm putting it out. Does that mean that contrary to reports, it's not going to be a reggae album? I ask, trying to hide my disappointment. Rihanna chuckles. Oh no, that's happening. She assures me. But on this, as in life, she won't be pinned down. I feel like I have no boundaries. I've done everything. I've done all the hits. I've tried every genre. Now I'm just, I'm wide open. I can make anything I want, which is way, I think that's a pinnacle of artistry, right? Once you scale that mountain and you're able to kind of, because I think part of the reason why a lot of artists aren't able to do that is obviously the kind of balance between pure artistry and obviously being able to be a commercial hit for your label. Labels invest money, time, resources into an artist. They hope you're going to be the next Rihanna. They hope they're going to be the next Drake. But if you're not able to deliver the bare minimum in terms of, um, you know, invested into you for the label and the commercial side of it, you can't expect them to allow you to go ahead and make your concept album. That's not the right way to. I think some artists get a bit deluded by that fact. I think you should always have the idea, the Henry Rollins idea, where you kind of take money from a corporation to kind of give back to your core, right? 
that kind of like punk rock idea where it's not it's, it's not selling out if you take that money to kind of feed back into your community where you come from and to also allow you to do the work that you always wanted to do so you should be able to in a concept album be able to supply your label with one or two tracks that you think is going to work for as a, especially if you're in your infancy it's going to work as a pop track because you look at someone like a frank ocean like you know nostalgia ultra or all those per previous tapes or sound nothing like what he's making now he's definitely in his kind of artistry weirdo bag because he's a he's afforded that luxury because he's obviously been able to pop up the numbers so if you can put up numbers you are able to do whatever the fuck you want and i think that's the difference between some of the bigger acts and some of the people who are tr who are pretending to be big acts is that they can't even put up artists they can't even put up numbers with the stuff that they think is poppy so imagine when they full they go full artistry and they start going to be weirder it's not going to be a good time so i thought that was an interesting tidbit and then the other tidbit i thought was interesting was her perspective on um the fact that she makes makeup for women of a darker complexion i like the fact that she just kind of you know was matter of fact about it that this should be normal the fact that it's a big deal is actually more upsetting to her than it is a, a pat on the back which i'll definitely agree with because i think you look at something like this, which I'm going to quickly get up here, right? So I read it. Let me just look at something like this. Or let me look at something like, let's just, yeah, let's just look at something else. I found on my Twitter quickly. It kind of speaks upon this. And I thought it's really cool. I think I just retweeted it. Let me go let's see if I can find it. Da, 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 da. And it does really speak upon, I think, what Rihanna's message is in terms of um, makeup for darker skin girls not shouldn't be like a thing that you should be celebrating it should just be what everyone's doing so this is this um someone shared this on twitter this person called uh lexa professional one word that's their handle or i said no this handle is a uh, squeezy f baby but you know it doesn't matter i'll link in the show notes so the tweet is of these um three girls right dressed up in this sort of like i don't i think it's a, a range of clothing uh from a brand called girlfriend lycra sort of like you know crop tops and lycra leggings and shit and they're all kind of you know different sizes different complexions different backgrounds colors race creed religions whatever it may be just a quintessential of the moment thing and the twitter person the person on twitter writ as a caption here i don't trust companies that advertise like this i feel like their corporate is all men is all mean white girls right which is definitely true right when you look down below and you saw the actual link to the actual team of this brand called girlfriend you look at who's actually behind it everyone in the kind of team is fairly skinny and fairly white right so it's they're obviously pandering to some extent right so then in this rihanna interview with uh vogue she says here that it should be normal let's see if i can get it up on here quickly to show you it says here normal mm. So, so it's a famous following here, right? Admittedly, um, this is relatively small fry compared to Fenty Beauty, she says, right? Um, which Rihanna founded almost three years ago, and now in uh, and is now a market colossal worth of some three billion dollars. That's more the Fenty effect. Other makeup brands, um, long guilty of neglecting women of color by offering few, if any, deeper shades, suddenly upped their diversity game, helped to establish forty shades as new industry standards. But Rihanna is reluctant to celebrate herself. She says, "I'm shocked by people saying, oh my God, what made you think of making makeup for black girls?'" Right? She continues, "I'm like, what? You thought this?" was like a marketing strategy like i'm a genius um, it's, it's shocking most of the time she says then then it turns to disappointment that this is a groundbreaking thing right now in my mind this is just normal which is definitely the thing i, I agree with because i think when um people were celebrating the demise of victoria's secret one thing that really got me curious was that i just couldn't understand why they would why they were putting themselves in that position why someone with victoria's secrets who has you know all this data of people that walk into their stores they have cameras in their stores they have trackers like every retail store has in terms of knowing the footfall you have probably people that work in the social media team people that work in seo they have a very good idea of who buys who's the actual woman for victoria's secret right then they have this show where they kind of victoria the victoria secrets angels and they come down the wrong way with these spectacular kind of outfits and gowns which you know for more for lack of a better term don't really reflect the person actually buys the brand but you're right you can suspend this belief for some reason right because you think you know hey it's these girls um they're it's something aspirational maybe for some women they, they want to remember when they were they used to look like that or when they were that skinny or aspire to be that slim whatever it may be but then times change and now suddenly the conversation is about inclusivity right about representing everybody which is shouldn't be a thing but let's imagine it is Victoria's Secret has all that data about who actually buys their product and they're still unable to just make that person 
the person who they kind of advertise or who's their ambassador. I don't understand why they didn't do that because for sure, if you've ever walked past the Torres Seco, if you walked anywhere past where people are walking out of it, the people that you see walking out of it don't look like Bella Hadid, they don't look like Gigi Hadid, they don't look like Kylie Jenner, they don't look like Kim Kardashian, they don't look like any of those people. They're just regular women who want to look sexy, who want to feel special, who want to buy something nice for themselves. So for Victoria's Secret to look at all that data and not have an idea of how to kind of pivot, it shows that they were just like have no idea what was going on. Um, so but then I also like the fact that someone like a Rihanna could come in and just kind of completely kill them and take them out of it with their with her kind of I, f- I forgot what the name is called of it the lingerie brand that she has that was really did really well they did a massive show had all these rappers performing um, really a kind of a celebration of womanhood in that regard and just did it in a really clever way and again I just I think um, that's probably the reason why those big companies exist right they exist because they kind of poke a reaction they kind of provoke a reaction of somebody like Ariana who's kind of sitting down there her in her own right th- th- thinking like what the fuck are these guys doing and then you just decide to do the thing yourself because it's not being done right away in it so I think that is probably the the reason of existing but definitely recommend you check it out it's a really cool article some of the really amazing pictures you've got this amazing image I, think, I don't know who did the photography for this actually I'm not sure doesn't it say who did the photography it doesn't does it but it's fucking beautiful man okay let's read it here so maybe they've got the actual cover images here that we can see the actual images but i think it's incredibly well done um recommend you check it out really amazing article uh she's just the coolest person in the world really isn't she really to be completely fair um yeah very very striking moment she's wearing a do in front of uh vogue i recommend you check it out because she's the best but yeah i like the fact that she described it being as normal it's not a big deal it shouldn't be a big deal and i think i highly highly agree with it too and i think it's um again it's just good to see that there's loads of other brands popping up out of the woodwork some of them independent some of them not well known or oh, is it by stephen klein okay awesome stephen klein photography who are kind of taking that the, taking that mantle and deciding to represent people who have been unrepresented and you know there's, a, there's a probably a lot more disposable there's probably a lot more I just don't get it, man. Imagine if you have Victoria's Secrets and you just like it's so. This is similar to like Kodak, and um, uh, who was it? Was it Instagram? What was the company that tried to buy into or and they turned down? Was it Instagram? Might have been Instagram. One of those kind of it's kind of similar to that sort of thing, right? The kind of long storied brand doesn't have a clue what's actually going on in the streets. Decide to kind of just rest on their laurels and now look at them out of business and not thriving at all but yeah recommend you check it out it's titled rihanna talks new music venti skincare and her plan to have three or four kids it's on vogue now again i'll link in the show notes for you guys to read yourselves if you're that way inclined so that's an hour again as per usual gonna end it right there if it's your first time listening of course please like and uh, subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app of course a five star review and share with your friends um any comments regarding what i spoke about you know leave them down there i'll get back in touch and i uh, will see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show but until then take care be safe <laughs>